Hello, my name is Shahriyar Shahriyari, and this is a lecture in a series of lectures on combinatorics. This lecture is, is on the pigeonhole principle, and basically I'm going to give you three examples of the use of this principle. This lecture is based on section 2.1 of my book, Invitation to Combinatorics, and uh, it's part one of two parts on this section. So let's get started. The pigeonhole principle is a very straightforward uh, principle, uh, and it's actually pretty amazing that it has any uses given the fact that how straightforward it is. It says that if you have n plus one pigeons and we put them into n pigeonholes, then at least one pigeonhole will contain two or more pigeons. Um, we could say this in different ways and, and you might say, well, what's a proof of that? Well, the proof is obvious, but, but if you wanted to write a proof, you could write it by contradiction. You could say, well, assume that you had these n plus one pigeons and you could place them in n pigeonholes in a way that none of, none of the pigeonholes had more than one pigeon. But then the most number of pigeons you would have would be one plus one plus one plus one and so on one for each pigeonhole would be n, but you have n plus one pigeons. That's a contradiction proving that um, you would have two, two or more pigeons, but this theorem really does not need a proof. We could reword it to make it sound more mathematical uh, by saying that, let's say that you have two sets P and H, P is really the pigeons and H is the holes. And if you have a function from P to H, um, so function from P to H means that you take an element of P and map it to an element of H. You take one pigeon, put it in a pigeonhole. And if you know that the size of P is greater or equal to the size of H, in um, the, the, the absolute value sign, when we use it for a set, we mean the cardinality of that set, the size of that set. So if the size of P is the greater than the size of H, then F is not one-to-one. -one. A map is one-to-one -one if two different elements don't go ever to the same place, but go to different places. And, and if you have that, the number of pigeons is greater than the number of holes, two of the pigeons, two of the elements of P will end up in the same hole, meaning that your function is not one-to-one. -one. Okay, so much for that. Let's just now see some examples. So the first example is the famous shaking hands problem. So you have, you're at a party and some people shake hands with some of the others. Um, you assume there are two, at least two people at the party. It wouldn't be much of a party if there, if there was only one person or no people at the party. But so there are at least two people at the party. And given that, no other assumption, I claim that there are at least two people at this party who shook hands with the same number of people. So if you go around the room and ask everyone, how many hands did you shake? Then there, you will automatically get two people that will, that will give you the same answer. Okay, so now what does this have to do with the pigeonhole principle and how do we prove this? So, so assume you have N people at the party and you go around again, ask each of them how many hands they shook and you get N answers because they're N people. What could those answers be? Those answers could be zero, one, two, through N minus one. These are going to be your pigeonholes. So we have N people, those are the pigeons and we have n pigeonholes, the possible answers. Why n? Well, because we're starting from zero and going all the way to n minus one. So zero, one, two, through n minus one, there's n pigeonholes, possible answers that people could give, and there are n people. Right now, we can't use the pigeonhole principle, but not because the number of pigeons and the pigeonholes is the same. It's, without thinking about it, it's possible that we would have n different answers. Someone would say zero, someone one, two, and, th and so forth. You have to think about it a little bit to get an insight. And the insight here is that, um, and you might want to stop the video and think about what the insight might be. Why is what, what, what we're going to say next? But the insight is that if one of the answers is zero, if someone said that the, the, the answer to your question, how many hands they shook was zero, then that means they didn't shake anyone's hand. That means that no one else's answer could have been n minus one because someone who, uh, who says n minus one N, I mean, there's N people, but one of them is themselves. The N minus one means that they shook everyone's hand. But if someone said that they didn't shake anyone's hand, um, that there could not have been anyone who shook everyone's hand. So uh, we, we now with this insight, we realize that the possible set of answers, we don't know quite exactly what it is, but it's either um, zero to N minus two, or 
it's from one to n minus one. Either you don't have zero or you don't have n minus one. So in either case, there's n minus one real poss possible answers. And, and so in either case, we have n people and we have n minus one possibilities. By the pigeonhole principle, at least two people must give you the same answer. And that's that. Okay, so now I'm gonna give you a slightly more complicated answer. Let's say you have an arbitrarily list sequence in order uh, of 100 positive integers. And all you know about them is that they add up to 152. So you 108 positive integers that add up to 152. Okay, I make a claim. I claim that somewhere in your list, there's gonna be an unbroken block of adjacent integers that add up exactly to 47. Now that's a weird kind of a, a claim to make. Like, I don't know what your integers are. Uh, you might've uh, tried very hard to try to avoid give, having a block of integers that add up to 47. And um, how do I know this is possible? How do I know that, uh, um, that, that this is possible? And the only thing I know is that they add up to 152. So for example, it can't be that they were all, um, uh, 48, like there was no, no numbers less than 47 because then they, then, they, then they would add up to a lot more. So, so that's the only sort of ho hopefully I have here. Now to use, uh, so, so how, why is that? Why is it that some string of adjacent ones must add up to 47? And here we have to be clever. The use of the pigeonhole principle because it's such an obvious thing needs clever arguments. And so here's, here's one. So the list of integers, I don't know what they are. You wrote them. It's A1 through A100. All I know is that, that there's 100 of them. Um, I'm going to look at the partial sums of these. Well, that makes sense because maybe if I start from the first one and go so far, I get 47. So that's not an unreasonable thing to do, to look at the partial sum. So S1 is going to be just A1, the first one. S2 is, is not going to be the second one. It's going to be A1 plus A2. Um, and S3 is going to be A1 plus A2 plus A3, all the way till S100 is going to be a1 plus a2 plus a8 a100. So there are 100 numbers here, and these are the partial sums. Now the last one, I actually know what it is. It's it's whatever we said it was. It was uh, 152. Um, now these numbers are all increasing these partial sums because the number the integers are positive integers. So every time when we add one more, we're getting a bigger number. There's never any equ the equality. The first one could be as small as one. Um, and the last one we know is 152 and then the other ones increase. Okay, so what? Still not clear what to do. The, insi uh, the insight here is to add 47 to each of SI, to each uh, one of these partial sums. It's not clear what that will do, but, but the proof of the pudding is in the eating. After we're done, you will agree that this was a, a, a smart insight to do. So if you add 47 to each of them, you get another set of numbers. So T1 is gonna be S1 plus 47. S1 was what? Was A1. Uh, T2 is gonna be S2 plus 47. S2 itself was A1 plus A2. Now I'm adding 47 to it. And I just continue that. And I get a hundred other um, um, numbers, T1, T2, through T100. Um, and these are each of them 47 more than the partial sums. Now I, um, and, and what about these T1 through T2? Well, because the first one was S1 plus 47, it's at least going to be 48 because S1 was at least one. T1 is at least 48. Again, each one of these is going to be actually greater than the one before because we are adding, um, uh, because uh, S1, uh, S1, S2, S3 was an increasing sequence. So will be the Ts. And the last one, uh, because we are adding 47 to 152 will be 199. Okay. Now, so what? Now I'm going to consider uh, the set of numbers, the S's, the partial sums, and the T's. The T's were the S's plus 47. And there's 200 of them all together. Uh, the S's, there was 100 of them. The T's were 100 of them. Now, when I write S1, S2 through S100, T1, T2 through T100, I'm not necessarily writing them in order of size because I actually don't know how they compare. I know the S's are going up and I know the T's are going up and I know T1 is bigger than S1, but I don't really know how they mesh, like where is each one of them. But I know I've got 200 numbers and all of them are between one and 199. 200 numbers, but between one and 199. So what? So I have 200 integers, those are the pigeons. 
and they're all between one and 199. And those are the pigeonholes. So what are the pigeonholes? One, two, three, four, 199. Those are the possibilities for these integers. These integers, each of them are one of these, have to go into one of these pigeonholes. By the pigeonhole principle, two of them have to be the same. So two of them are gonna be equal. Now the S's can't be equal to each other and the T's can't be equal to each other. So one of the S's must be the same as one of the T's. So, so maybe SJ is the same as TI, but what was TI? TI was SI plus 47. So what does that mean? That means that SJ minus SI is 47. Okay, so the difference between SJ and SI is 47. So what? What is SJ minus SI? Now remember what SJ was. Um, SJ was a partial sum, A1 through AJ. And a SI was a partial sum, A1 through, um, uh, A1 through AI added up. Now when you subtract, a lot of things cancel. What doesn't cancel is AI plus one plus AI plus two plus AI all the way till AJ. So you get all the integers added up from I plus one to J. So these are consecutive integers on your list. And what do they add up to? To SJ minus SI, which we just proved is 47. So I found you a sequence of uh, consecutive integers in your list, no matter what it is. Um, that is going to be, if you have 100 positive integers that add up to 152, there's going to be a sequence of positive integers that add up to 47. Now, this shows that you can use the pigeonhole principle in some subtle ways. And, and it's not like if you're just sort of walking down the street and thinking about it, you're not going to come up with this idea. You've had, you have to have tried different things to, to realize this. Okay, so let's go on to our uh, uh, last example of the use of the pigeonhole principle. Um, and and I, I guess the point of this lecture is that the pigeonhole principle, even though pretty straightforward, comes up in not so obvious ways, maybe. So I'm, I'm going to give you a task. Um, look at the numbers between 1 and 270 and pick 136 of them. So pick 136 distinct integers from this set, no matter which ones you want. You know, you could pick the first 136 or you could put the last or every other one or, you know, whatever. Pick 136 of these integers. Then again, I make a claim. I make a claim that even though I don't know which ones you chose, among the integers, integers that you chose, there's going to be at least two different integers that such that one divides the other, such that one is a factor of the other. Like if, like there's two and eight or um, uh, 13 and 169 there's gonna be at least two that are going to be, one is gonna be a factor of the other, one is gonna divide the other um, uh, exactly. So again, this is not an obvious fact. Uh, it's true if my claim is true, but, but not an obvious fact and one that we can prove using the um, pigeonhole principle. So, what, how, so we're gonna do that. We're, again, you're picking 136 integers from one through 270, and we want to know why is it that among the ones you chose, no matter what you did, um, there's going to be one divides the other. Okay. This one, the sort of the insight, the insight is like all over the place. Like you have to uh, just like where the pigeonholes are, right? everything. There's going to be 135 pigeonholes, but what are they? Uh, I mean, you picked 136 integers. So having 135 pigeonholes is not a bad thing, but, but what are they? Well, they're going to be the odd numbers from one through 270. Uh, I mean, from one to 270, there's 270 integers, one through 270. And then half of those are even, half of them are odd. Uh, the odd ones are gonna be our pigeonholes. Okay. And I'm gonna put the integers you picked in this pigeonholes, but how am I gonna do that? Um, so uh, the, the, cho the cho chosen 136 integers are the pigeons, but how am I gonna put um, uh, which pigeon into which pigeonhole. This is what I'm going to do. Uh, if you, what, the number you picked is n, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor it, not completely, but I'm going to factor all the possible twos out of it. So whatever your integer is, you can write it as two to the k times m, where m is odd. So m doesn't have any factors of two. You, you pulled out all the factors of two, and, and you got two to something, maybe two to zero, because maybe n was odd already, uh, but, but, but two to something. And m is odd. 
Now, M is odd and between 1 and 269. And that M is the pigeonhole that N is going to go into. So assign N to pigeonhole M. So as an example, if you, if the number, if you had picked 20, 20 factors into 4 times 5, 2 squared times 5. Pulling out all the 2s gives you 2 squared times 5. And 5 is, that, um, is, is, the, is the pigeonhole that 20 is assigned to. But five is also assigned to that pigeonhole because five is two to the zero times five. 40 is also assigned to the pigeonhole five because it's two cubed times five. Okay, but now um, we do have 135 pigeonholes and we have 136 uh, integers and we have decided how we're gonna assign them to the pigeonholes. And so two pigeons gonna be in the same pigeonhole. Well, what does that mean? That means that among the numbers you picked, there's going to be two numbers and after factoring, they're going to have the same odd part because that was the pigeonhole and they ended up in the same pigeonhole. So they're going to be of the form two to the K times M, one of them. The other one is going to be two to something else, two to L times M, but the M's are going to be the same. And if you look at these two numbers, they divide each other. The, the, um, the, the smaller one divides the larger one. And in fact, when you divide them, the M's cancel and you get a power of two. So not only uh, I, can, I can predict that two of the integers divide each other, but two of the integers divide each other. And when you divide, uh, the, the quotient is going to be a power of two. And uh, that's the, that was the last example uh, for the use of the pigeonhole principle. In the next lecture, which is the second lecture for this section, we will prove the erdor sekeresh theorem, which is a more complicated use of the pigeonhole principle.